Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker, and I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. And today, we look at Bechamp or Pasteur, a lost chapter in the history of biology by Ethel D. Hugh. The writer has made an effort in his prior books and pamphlets to show that the germ theory is false and that illness is practically always due to errors of diet or manner of living, the germs being present solely as the scavengers of dead and waste tissues in foods and not as the cause of the disease. If you explore the history of the medical profession and the various ideas regarding the cause of disease that were held by leading physicians before Pasteur, first promulgated his notorious germ theory, you will find convincing evidence that Pasteur discovered nothing and that he deliberately appropriated, falsified, and perverted another man's work. The germ theory, so-called long antedated Pasteur, so long that he was actually able to present it as new and then he got away with it. There is Pasteur's great thought in toto, his complete germ theory, and yet put in print over a century before he thought of it and published it as his own. The specific disease doctrine is the grand refuge of weak, uncultured, unstable minds, such as now rule in the medical profession. There are no specific diseases. There are specific disease conditions. Here you have Florence Nightingale, the most famous nurse in history, after a long, lifelong experience with infections. When a drug is administered by the mouth, as was beautifully pointed out by Dr. J. Garth Wilkinson, in proceeding along the elementary canal, it encounters along its own line a series of chemical laboratories where it is analyzed synthesized and prepared for extraction and finally extracted or it may be ejected from the stomach or overcome by an antidote but when nature's coat of mail the skin is violated and the drug is inserted beneath the skin nature's line of defense is outflanked and rarely can anything be done to hinder or to prevent the action of the drug, no matter how injurious or even fatal it may be. All the physicians of the world are incompetent either to foresee its action or to hinder it. As occurred with flu in the war, which was merely a mutation of the typhoid germ, in the vaccines used against typhoid and paratyphoid, every vaccine produced a new form of germ, which make the occurrence of the disease much more marked than previously. This is why we had the 1918 flu epidemic with the highest death rate on record. It is the reason Koch had so many deaths and also the reason for the large increase in the death rates of other diseases. Most physicians will acknowledge that when the changes in a germ occur, there is particularly no possibility of it preventing or curing any disease. And while these changes may not run as high as 80% with all biologicals, nevertheless it was shown that it can and does occur with sufficient frequency to render all such methods utterly unworthy of confidence and unfit to rely on to any degree. And Professor Metrikov's statements that agglutination is of no value 
as an indication of immunity or curing power. It seems to wipe out any small remaining chance that serums can be beneficial under any conditions. In other words, it seems that when we get vaccinated and fail to catch any disease afterwards, it is either only an accident or it is due more to our natural immunity than it is to the serum. With all the evidence that germs can change their characteristics, from Miss Nightingale and Professor Bichamp, to Lanise, to Rosenau and others, how can anyone expect a germ to remain constant through any test or remain true to its original characteristics after being tested? As the average serum is only some toxic decomposing proteins and some germs that are reworkers of dead tissue or a waste, but which the doctors believe to be the cause of the dead tissue that they're found within. The germs are very apt to change their characteristics as the toxins break up just as they have repeatedly been shown to do elsewhere in nature. In the days when Antoine Bechamp and Louis Pasteur commenced their work, the understanding of the subject was in a state of confusion. Three paramount problems faced scientific inquiry of the time. Number one, what is living matter? This protoplasm, so-called from the Greek words meaning first and formed, is it a mere chemical compound? Number two, how does it come into being? Can it arise spontaneously or must it always be derived from pre-existing life? And number three, what causes matter to undergo the change known as fermentation? It was at the beginning of 1873 that Pasteur was elected of a majority of one vote to his place among the free associates of the Academy of the Medicine. His ambition had indeed spurred him to open a new era in medical physiology and pathology. But it would seem to have been unfortunate for the world that instead of putting forward the fuller teachings of Bechamp, he fell back upon the cruder ideas now widely known as the germ theory of disease. He even used his influence with the Academy of Science to anathematize the very word microzyma. It must strike anyone a topsy-turvy method to start a cure of a natural disease by a production of another unofficial disease. Artificial one in the principle of vicarious suffering can surely only hold good ethically by voluntary self-sacrifice. In regards to the particular accident of the stale culture, which was made the foundation stone for the whole system of inoculation, like most people, Pasteur had accepted vaccination without personal investigation, and so like many, many others, showed himself possessed of a simple credulity that is the antithesis to scientific cautiousness. The general public, however intelligent, are struck only by that which it takes little trouble to understand. They have been told that the interior of the body is something more or less like the contents of a vessel filled with wine and that this interior, if not injured, we do not become ill, except when germs, originally created morbid, penetrate into from without and then become microbes. The public, the public do not know whether this is true. They do not even know what a microbe is but they take it on the word of the master. They believe it because it is simple and easy to understand. They believe and they repeat that the microbes make a seal without inquiring further because they have not the leisure or, nor perhaps the capacity to probe to the depths at which they're asked to believe. 
On the other hand, experts have been educated from the start to consider microorganic life from the Pasteurian standpoint and to accept these theories as though they were axioms. Thus, it is perhaps understandable that it is only from an unbiased vantage ground that the contradictions of the germ theory of disease can be correctly understood to be ridiculous. It rules the postulates of Dr. Robert Koch, state in Italia, that a causative disease germ should be present in every case of a disease and never found apart from it. What are the facts? Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read. Never stop learning. Thank you. Love and respect.